problems of criminals or civil litigants and, and always felt that that wasn't so important as was the fact that juries uh, and people, the citizenry having to serve, the jury system served as an educational system for the people and made them knowledgeable of what, uh, about what they were doing and uh, was, had its use in that more than its, more than its use in the other uh, aspect of taking care of a problem. De Tocqueville saw all of this way back then in, in 1830, and it's no different today. It's, it's exactly the way it is today. Washington Journal continues. Coming up uh, in a little bit less than an hour at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, we're going to have live coverage here on C-SPAN of day three of those hearings into the TWA explosion from uh, July of 1996. The NASA National Transportation Safety Board is uh, conducting hearings up at the Baltimore Convention Center. We have a, a picture from the uh, room there. Again, less than an hour they're going to start up. And uh, we have Sylvia Adcock this morning also in Baltimore. She is a transportation reporter for the newspaper called Newsday. Good morning, Sylvia. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, what will the focus be today in the hearing? This morning we're going to hear a lot of testimony about possible ignition sources in the center fuel tank. Um, people from FAA and Boeing will talk about what could go wrong and what they think couldn't go wrong inside that tank. Um, this afternoon's testimony should be very interesting. They're going to do some focusing on aging aircraft. Um, a little bit more on, on, on uh, witnesses. Can you tell us uh, more specifically who the folks will be that we'll hear from? Well, we've got, um, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Joe Leonard, who w is with the uh, California Institute of Technology. We heard from him yesterday afternoon, and he spoke a great deal about a lot of tests he's done on um, fuel flammability and the properties of jet fuel. Um, we're also going to hear several uh, officials from the FAA, and a couple of the people that we heard from yesterday morning from Boeing, Boeing officials who deal with fuel tank design. Um, that'll be the morning testimony. For the afternoon, um, as I said, they're going to be looking at aging aircraft, which should be very interesting. The plane was 25 years old, and there's some concern that uh, there may not have been, uh, that, that there's not enough focus on the aging systems of an airplane as opposed to just the aging structure, which is what the aging aircraft program does and that the FAA has. We'll talk a little bit about where we've been so far this week, but let me take a moment to re-invite the viewers and uh, radio listeners to phone in with their questions and comments for Sylvia Adcock. She is transportation reporter for the newspaper uh, Newsday out of New York. If you are a Democrat, you can call 202-624-1111. 202-624-1115 if you are a Republican, and everyone else can call the number 202-737-6734. Again, we'll talk for a couple minutes here and then start taking your phone calls on these TWA hearings. Again, day three today uh, from Baltimore. Sylvia Adcock, a little bit from uh, uh, your story here today in Newsday. The hearing on TWA Flight 800 began to resemble a trial of airline manufacturers and their regulators yesterday. What uh, was yesterday like? What, what did you see? Well, yesterday morning I found quite interesting. The FAA and air, the airframe manufacturers were really put on the defensive as far as how they've dealt with the issue of exploding fuel tanks. Um, you know, the industry has known this is a problem for some time. They've always gone along with the um, philosophy that we know the vapors in the tank are flammable and subject to explosion, but we'll make sure the ignition sources stay out of the tank. What the NTSB pointed out yesterday was that they did nothing after a 1990 fuel tank explosion in Manila that killed eight people and um, basically questioned them pretty hard on how come you didn't c go back then after that crash and, uh, you know, really do something about this. The uh, New York Times, not sure if you had a chance to uh, see it or not yet. This was their take this morning on the uh, front page. Boeing says vapor threat requires a new fuel tank. Uh, your colleague Matthew Wald writing that in an effort to prevent explosions like the one that caused this crash, uh, Boeing officials said today that the design of the company's jetliners needed to be changed to guard against the buildup of flammable fumes. 
Although the cause of the explosion on the Boeing 747 has still not been determined, the company's statement was a clear departure from a 40-year-old principle of commercial aviation design. Tell us uh, your thoughts on that, and tell us more about Boeing and their role in all this. Yes, that, that is de definitely a departure for um, the aviation industry to say that they might need to redesign uh, the planes to prevent these type of fuel tank explosions. Um, Boeing plays a very important part in this hearing, obviously. I mean, they're the world's largest uh, aircraft manufacturer, one of the largest companies in this country certainly and uh, you know they made the plane that had the problem so they have to have a lot of uh, I guess I, like I said they were put, put on the defensive somewhat yesterday and they did come out and say that they are looking at uh, possibly changing the design of the airplanes. And how do you think they've been handling themselves? Um, it, I think they've been handling themselves well I mean they're you know they're a company I believe they're very concerned about safety and I, I think they've been you know answering the questions as best they can it's put uh, the entire industry in a bit of an awkward position, like I said, because they have always gone along with this certain philosophy that, you know, we'll go ahead and have fuel tanks that can have flammable vapors in them, but we'll keep the ignition sources out. But obviously with TWA 800 and the Manila accident uh, seven years ago, um, the ignition sources can't be kept out of the tank. So that's the problem. Let's go to our uh, phone lines. We have a call from the independent line this morning, Franklin, Virginia. Good morning. Yes, I'm just calling to uh, see if your reporter also covered the uh, hearings of the uh, U.S. Air 427 at Pittsburgh and Springfield. I did not cover those hearings. I'm somewhat familiar with that crash, however, but I, I was not at those hearings. Well, let's ask the caller. Why, why do you ask about that, caller? I just, I just wanted to remark that I attended those particular hearings, and as I watch the uh, ones on C-SPAN, I see uh, almost a scripted response on the part of Boeing, i.e., in each of these crashes, they seem to have eliminated everything except the fact that there was either a mechanical or electronic failure, i.e., a spark causing the uh, incendiary uh, cause of the 800 crash, and in the case of Pittsburgh, it was a power control unit, which uh, went hard over involuntarily causing that accident. Everything else was pretty much eliminated and they've they've accepted the fact that that's what caused it. But I'm just astounded by, in each of these cases, the absolute denial on the part of Boeing officials who are there denying that they, the uh, spark could have even evolved in the fuel tanks. And in the Pittsburgh one, they were denying that this rudder could go over voluntarily. Call it later later tests prove that it could. Let me uh, get a response from Sylvia Adcock in just a second, but let me ask you, why did you attend those hearings? What brought you out? I lost my daughter in those here, in, in, in the pits, in the pits, so I went because I had to go, and, and uh, for that reason I went. Thank you for sharing uh, your, your thoughts there. Let's uh, hear from Sylvia Adcock. He talked about scripted language by officials uh, in more than one hearing. What do you make of that uh, assumption? I, I think that to a certain extent that that may be true. You're going to hear a lot of denying. Um, you know, you're not going to hear uh, Boeing or the airline come out and say, um, oh yes, you're right, it's my fault, this is what we did wrong. That's just not going to happen. I think one of the reasons is you have to remember, you know, Boeing is being sued by the victim's families. Um, that was also happening in the Pittsburgh crash. Um, although the NTSB's probable cause, which they'll eventually reach on this crash, is not admissible in court, um, a lot of the stuff that happens here will be used um, in the courtroom. So Boeing is sitting up at the front of the room and they've got their lawyers there with them um, at the party tables. And so I believe there is a little bit of, you know, concern about what's being said publicly here. Let's go to the Republican line to Poughkeepsie, New York. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Hi. I uh, work for a large computer corporation and I do uh, failure analysis and systems recovery for these complex uh, machines. And what I'd like to comment on is, is the designs of these complex systems it's extremely hard to take in all the variables that occur over different times. And I think we've seen this in the reporting of, of this issue where with the center tank being low on fuel and the va vapors being at certain critical temperatures, it's very hard to judge and, and be able to test and design to those conditions. Now we've become very good at this, but you know, if can we expect that our manufacturers and the design people can always take everything into account? And in the cases uh, your speaker is saying today, where the lawyers are there discussing this, 
are, are someone, is somebody always going to be liable for this type of issue? Thank you, caller. I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question a little bit. I'm not sure I caught all of it. Poughkeepsie, are you still there? Or Paul, could you Poughkeepsie, are you still there? I think I, I had some problems hearing him too because there's yeah, a lot of. Yeah, I things. wasn't sure. I think he may have been asking about, you know, how do we, how responsible or how liable are the engineers, um, you know, who design the planes? And I think it's obviously impossible to eliminate every conceivable um, safety problem. The point is just that, you know, we try to make aviation as safe as it can possibly be. And it is pretty safe. Um, this, this kind of accident is a rarity. Sylvia Adcock is with uh, Newsday. Newsday won the Pulitzer Prize for its coverage so far. Uh, when did that award come out? I believe it was last April. What did, uh, what did it take to uh, uh, eventually get that Pulitzer? Well, we worked pretty hard. We were right there on the scene very quickly. We mobilized very quickly on the night of the crash. Um, and we, we had uh, lots and lots of coverage that was very detailed and I think very thorough for a long time. And I think that's what did it. It was a lot of work on the part of a lot of people, hundreds of people. We can take uh, another call, but take a look at the website from uh, Newsday as we take this call. There it is. You can access that through our website. At www.cspan.org. There's a lot of information, including Sylvia's, Sylvia Adcock's uh, piece today titled Going on the Attack. Officials pointedly probe lack of action by jet makers. We go uh, to Clinton, New Jersey on the independent line. Hello, Clinton. Oh, hello. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I'd just like to ask, I'm wondering if the, uh, you know, the, the missile theory will be uh, a part of the, uh, part of the hearings today. Thank you. Caller, Sylvia, it was part of the hearing yesterday, right? Uh, it was a part, I believe it was uh, Monday uh -huh. afternoon that, Monday. Um, yeah, they presented a lot of radar data and uh, testimony that said that there was nothing in the area, no evidence of any projectiles or anything that could have uh, gone through this plane. They also presented an expert from uh, China Lake who uh, basically does nothing but look at the kind of damage aircraft suffers from missile attacks. And this gentleman testified that he had been over the wreckage from TWA 800 many times and found no evidence of, of any kind of uh, warhead detonation or uh, even a missile that maybe didn't detonate and just pierced the plane. There just wasn't any evidence of that. I think they've taken care of all they're going to say about that in, in this hearing so far. Let's go to Chautauqua, New York on the Republican line. Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, <coughs> I have a question uh, regarding <coughs> the... Uh, number of miles flown by Boeing 747s in respect to the deaths that have occurred in Boeing 747s. What's, what is the ratio of that? Thanks, caller. I'm not sure I can give you the answer to that. Um, I, I know there are some 970 Boeing 747s in service. There have been uh, very few accidents on the plane, and it does have uh, what aviation officials say is an excellent safety record. I don't really, I couldn't really give you the ratio of miles uh, traveled to passenger deaths, but I would say that um, it's, it's the percentage of, of deaths per miles would be very, very small. Sylvia Adcock, talk a little bit more about the, the afternoon part of today's hearing that you said would be particularly interesting on aging aircraft. I, I asked that because, and I read that, that this particular plane last year had uh, nearly 17,000 flights behind it, is that right? Nearly 17,000, I'm sorry. 17,000 uh, flights that it had taken? Yes, I believe that's correct. How significant was that? Well, it's, it's not an unusual number for a 25-year-old plane, and there are a lot of planes over 20 years old uh, flying around in this country, and, and you know, I, they're safe. I'm not going to say that they're not safe, but um, there is a push to expand the aging aircraft program that's in place at this point. For years, the industry has been looking only at the structure of the plane as it ages, meaning the fuselage, the airframe itself, how much stress can it take over the years. And there is a program in place to mandate uh, certain kinds of inspections and repairs after certain numbers of flights. However, the aging aircraft program does not look at the inner workings of the plane, the electrical systems, hydraulics, all those kinds of things. The industry says that those things simply get replaced when they fail. There's concern now with Flight 800 that wiring might have been a problem that might have caused the spark to enter the fuel tank. And if that's the case, do we need to take a closer look at how those systems are maintained as the planes get older? Because the fleet, the domestic uh, aviation fleet is, is aging and is a lot older than it used to be before deregulation of the airlines. We go back to the independent line to Largo, Florida. Good morning to you. Good morning. 
Hi. I'm very curious about a lot of things involving the fuel. What we looked at here, wait a minute, i got to shut this TV off. I don't want to hear myself. Caller, specifically, what are you concerned about? The temperature of the fuel. Now, I've heard two conflicting stories, one from the retired Air Force man about the fuel not being explosive and so forth, and the other people telling us that, yes, it was. Well, of course, the fuel itself is not. It's the fumes. Well, let's see if Sylvia Adcock can straighten that out for us. Sylvia? I, I think it's obvious at this point that the, the uh, fuel vapors can become explosive uh, when they're heated to a certain temperature. And the belief is that the air conditioning packs on the airplane, which on the 747 are located directly below the center fuel tank, do heat up that center tank to, into the explosive range. Now, there is a lot of uh, still, still uh, studies left to be done on the properties of the commercial jet fuel that's being used. There is also, incidentally, a bit of a push to look at possibly lo using a lower volatility fuel, a fuel that is less explosive or flammable on commercial airplanes, similar to what's used in the Navy. Sylvia Adcock, have you had much contact with the families that are in attendance at the hearings? Um, I have not. Uh, no, one of my colleagues who's with me here from Newsday has had a lot of contact with them, and I do know from talking to her that it's been difficult for them. I think it's good for them to come and really see all this information laid out in such a detailed and thorough presentation, but uh, some of the testimony has been difficult for them, and they have left the hearing room on occasion when it's become difficult. Hearing starts in about uh, 35 minutes. We go back to the Democratic line at Chimney Rock, North Carolina. Hello. Hi. Hi. Go right ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to make an observation mm -hmm. about both the value jet and, the, and this flight here that went down and where they went down. It seems that both flights, uh, uh, the catalyst was the, the fuel tanks, and both flights went down over areas which made recovery very hard. And I was noticing uh, in the Wall Street Journal the amount of stock options, you know, um, puts and calls that were wrote against the value jet stock. And uh, I, I just can't help wondering if the Justice Department has n ever looked into, um, you know, that the, our safety versus uh, letting Wall Street write stock options, which can be manipulated. Uh, I know it's a, it's a far stretch to make that statement, but you have to wonder why, um, you know, our safety uh, can be leveraged on Wall Street and um, be manipulated, uh, especially when you think about how both flights went down. Thanks, caller. I'm not sure I, I know enough about the business end of it to um, really comment on that, but I don't know of any, of any move by the Justice Department to look into that. Uh, Sylvia Adcock, James Kallstrom uh, making news yesterday. He is uh, leaving the FBI. Of course, you, we saw a lot of him uh, right after the crash and for the several months following that story here in USA Today. Kallstrom quits FBI, lead probe of jet blast. He's going to become a um, bank uh, executive. Uh, what do you make of uh, his story and his role in all of this? Well, I was surprised to hear that he was leaving. Um, you know, I think he did a, a wonderful job in... Uh, in handling the situation as, as it went along. It was uh, difficult for the FBI because, of course, immediately everyone thought it was a bomb, including a lot of people on the safety board. It just had that, that look about it. And as time went on, there was no evidence of, of any uh, you know, high energy blast like a bomb would make. And um, you know, the FBI, however, couldn't just pull out without being absolutely positively sure that they'd looked at everything. So they didn't pull out until last month. And, that made this investigation somewhat unusual. I was going to ask you, does the FBI pulling out make the NTSB's role in all of this and in these hearings any different than it would have been? I think it makes their role more, more clear. I think they could have had this hearing without that press conference last month with Jim Kallstrom. Um, however, it, it's very clear now that the NTSB is the lead agency. There's no other federal agency that's really playing a strong part in, in this crash. And it's also very clear that, you know, we're looking at mechanical failure here. We're not looking at sabotage. And once again, uh, take us through, uh, you talked about today earlier, take us through the rest of the week. What will you be looking for? Well, as I said, I think the aging aircraft panel this afternoon is probably going to be one of the most interesting uh, things that will be going on. Um, they'll be ending the conference probably Thursday is my guess, although it was originally supposed to last a week, with um, a discussion of, of ways to reduce the flammability of the fuel tanks. Um, 
They'll have some testimony from some military experts about how the military has handled this problem. Also, they'll be looking at how does the military communicate with commercial aviation about problems on airplanes and, and ways to address those problems. Um, so I think all of that will be interesting. By the time the week's over, I think, you know, we certainly won't know what caused the crash. The NTSB doesn't know that yet either, although, of course, they know it was the center fuel tank explosion, but we won't know what sparked it. But we will have a great deal more detail and laid out in a very thorough um, and compelling way. And real quickly, what would happen after the hearings? A report or, or, or anything? After the hearings, uh, the NTSB will continue their investigation and their studies. Many of the studies, such as some of the ones we heard about yesterday, are uh, not even complete. Um, they won't ex be expected to, to find a probable cause on the crash until, I believe, the end of next year. Sylvia Adcock is a transportation reporter with uh, Newsday. Newspaper has been with Newsday uh, for several years now. Newsday has won the Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of uh, the explosion of that plane. Uh, you previously worked uh, as a uh, desk reporter and copy editor. You also worked in Wichita at a newspaper there in Raleigh, and uh, she went to school at North Carolina State University. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. And again, uh, that hearing is expected to start in about a half an hour. That is a live picture from the convention center up in Baltimore, day three of five hearings today.